What's up, everyone? My name is Jordan. We're so glad you're joining us today, wherever, whenever you're joining us for Slow City Church, at home, online, wherever you are. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been really loving this series that we're in called Health, and maybe loving isn't the best word because I've been really challenged by it. It's been really powerful for me. It's really caused me uh, to take a step back from my life in some ways and look at different areas of my life, areas that I would have said were just compartmentalized little pieces of my life, and it's challenged me uh, to see the way that I am one whole person. I think that's really important. And I can, I can promise you that no one steps right here to record a sermon uh, for our online purposes and, and, and does it lightly. Anytime we deliver a message like this, we feel the weight of it. We know that it matters deeply. We know that it has eternal significance. We try to approach it with confidence and with boldness, but we also try to approach it with humility, and with grace. And this series, in my humble opinion, has felt especially delicate, has felt particularly delicate, like it needs to be handled with a special kind of care. Uh, A few years ago, uh, I was spending a weekend at my mother-in-law's house. Um, I wanted to make myself a cup of coffee in the morning. She had a Keurig, so I, I brewed a little cup uh, of coffee, and I was as, as I was taking some of my first sips from the mug, I was told that I had selected no ordinary mug. No, this was a very special, unique, one of a kind mug from a local company called Louisville Stoneware, and they only made one off special coffee mugs. And I thought to myself, I better be careful with this coffee mug. I better be careful today. Now, I did the math real quick. I've held approximately 10,000 coffee cups in my lifetime, probably more, and I have never broken one until that day, until the day I was holding the special, unique, delicate, one-of-a-kind mug. I broke the mug. Now, my mother-in-law did what you're supposed to do. She was incredibly gracious with me. I don't know if she went in her bedroom and, and sobbed later that evening, but she assured me it was no big deal. There were many other coffee mugs in the cabinet that could take its place. But I honestly feel a little bit like I'm holding that mug today. This has been no ordinary sermon series. These issues that that we've explored and that Brent has explored uh, over the past few weeks of mental and and emotional health, relational health, the body and sexuality, these are topics that are hugely central to who we are. These are things that are hugely central to our identity or to our perception of our identity, to our self-worth, and to our everyday lives. These can be really, really hard conversations to have, but they're conversations that are worth having. And I'm thankful for this church, honestly. I'm thankful for a place where everyone is welcome, where nobody's perfect, and where there's hope for everyone. I'm thankful for conversations that have been birthed out of this series, and I'm thankful for the grace of the people who are having the conversations. And today we're going to be exploring another aspect of health, and to be honest, this may be one that some of you may never, ever think about. While for others of you, this may be something that you think about literally every single day of your life, and it's this idea of vocational health vocational health. And there are many different definitions for the word vocation, depending on where you look. And there's a wide range of meanings from what you do is just a specific job or or career. And it ranges all the way to this very broad and overarching sense of purpose or calling on your life. And I think the truth is kind of both and. Vocation does have to do with with what you work on, what you do as a job or career, and it has something to do with your overall purpose in life. And I want to explore what it might look like to have a healthy view of our job, the work that we put our hands to on a daily basis, a healthy view of our gifts and our purpose in a grander sense, and what it might look like for the way of Jesus to intersect with those things, our resources, and more. I love that even from from the beginning of of creation, 
built into God's design is this idea of work or, or progress or thriving or advancing or however you want to call it. In the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, 26 and 28 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. That's important. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and he said to them, listen, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over it the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every little creature, every living creature that moves on the ground. God himself puts work and effort into this beautiful creation. And then he says, now do something with it. Take it and do something with it. And so as we live into our very identity as image bearers of God by nature, that means that we have to do something with what we've been given. We have to do something with what we've been given. One of my biggest regrets in life is not being a more motivated and proactive student. I started really, really strong. I was a mathlete. I had a teacher to prove it. My mom threw it away and she has never admitted it, but I know she did. Uh, I've always loved to learn. It's always been really important to me and to who I am. But at some point, around high school, I just let the clutch out a little bit because procrastination is kind of a spiritual gift of mine. And, and, And in my senior year of college, I took this class that was a cornerstone for every graduate of Cincinnati Bible College. Everybody had to take it. It was a huge deal. It was called New Testament Seminar. And it was a research class where 75% of your total grade for the whole semester was based on this one 30 page research paper and presentation. Now, there were 30 students in the class, and the professor had 30 topics that could be chosen for your research project. Every student was instructed to stop by the professor's office and to choose the topic that they wanted for their project. First come, first serve. Now, every, every topic was formatted in the exact same way. They, they were all the New Testament and fill in the blank. So there were some really good ones on this list. There was the New Testament and capital punishment. I remember that one. The New Testament and politics. The New Testament and the end times. Man, there were some really juicy, meaty subjects to choose from. Now, I knew it was a very bad sign when a few days later, I got an email from the professor and the subject line said, your research topic. (laughs) And it turns out every other student had decided uh, to act quickly. And so 29 of the 30 topics had already been chosen uh, by other students. And so by process of elimination, my research topic was the New Testament and the global marketplace. And I honestly could not have fathomed a less interesting and less inspiring topic to write a 30-page research paper on. However, God is a God of redemption and his ways are good. So though I'm not sure I fully appreciated it at the time, this ended up being really enlightening for me. And it ended up becoming something really important for my perspective of the world we live in and of the gospel. Two big takeaways I had from doing this whole project were number one, it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult to swipe my credit card without enabling or perpetuating the mistreatment or the oppression of people all over the world. And that's a scary thing. It's a topic we're going to have to save for another day, but it matters. And the second thing that really stood out to me is there are almost 8 billion people in the world right now. 8 billion people, all of which have a unique and a significant impact and footprint in this world. Every one of them. And this is incredible. This is incredible for me to think about. Whether you lay tile or or you manage a million dollar account or whether you care for your children or or you pour espresso drinks or you educate or you wait tables or you care for the sick or anything else you could possibly do, the work that we put our hands to on a daily basis has an incredible impact on the world, has an incredible impact on our neighbor and for the kingdom of God. 
Colossians 3.23 often gets brought up uh, and used in this discussion, and rightly so. It says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And this should be read as both an encouragement and as a challenge. That's how much of Scripture is. It's an encouragement and a challenge. The encouragement is this, that what we do from 9 to 5 or even beyond that can be brought under the Lordship of Jesus, meaning that Jesus is the master of your life and your work week is a function of a life that flows from that truth. So if if Jesus is the master of your life, then your work Your nine to five can be an expression of that. Our work can be valuable and it can be meaningful no matter what it is. But this verse is also a a challenge, a challenge that our work, the thing that likely consumes the majority of our waking hours in a week, cannot and should not be the master of our lives. One of the most common things that I, I've been asked, and I did many years of student ministry, but then even beyond uh, working with adults, uh, the most common, one of the most common questions I've, I've been asked is something to the effect of, how do I know what God wants me to do with my life? How do I know what God wants me to do with my life? Now, they're really asking something a little more specific, like how do I know what college I'm sp- supposed to choose, or how do I know which major I should select, or how do I know which job to pursue or which job to accept? Now, 10 times out of 10, I always skirt answering this question the way that they hope I will answer the question. Instead, I point them to Matthew chapter 22 when the teachers of the law uh, get in front of Jesus and they ask him, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus responds, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and this is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, we're taught from a very young age, from a very young age, and it gets younger every day, we're taught from a very young age that what we choose as a career will be the most important thing about us. And and I think it's important that we be totally clear, this is not true. This is just not true. The the most important thing about us is that that we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and that we love our neighbor. However, our career, or more broadly speaking, our vocation, can play a huge, huge role in, in how this manifests in our life. And so what might it look like to experience vocational health as it pertains to our nine to five? It it might look like having the courage to ask yourself, does my job intersect with my God-given passions and abilities? Does my job intersect with my God-given passions and abilities? If not, is that an intentional choice as you consider the way that you can most closely follow Jesus? Or is it a decision based in fear and lack of trust? And if it's the latter, it's possible that God's calling you to pursue something else, not necessarily something better or or worse by the world standards, but something that more fully integrates your faith in Jesus with the way that you spend a huge portion of your time and energy. Without asking if your work aligns with your faith in Jesus, work can become a distraction, a distraction from the things that, that God has equipped and prepared you for. Vocational health and pursuing it may look like asking yourself if you have healthy healthy boundaries in your vocation. It's totally possible that you're super passionate about what you do. You feel confident in the way that your work contributes to God's intentions for the world. However, you, you may have discovered that that old adage is true. Too much of a good thing isn't necessarily a good thing. Maybe the fulfilling vocation that you feel called to has turned into seven-day work weeks with no margin for rest. Or maybe it's meant that you haven't been home to tuck in your kids for months on end. Or maybe it's drained you to the point that you have no energy 
to pursue the worthy and noble opportunities that God is placing in front of you. Or maybe it's, it's the other side of the coin. that Maybe you have to ask if the values of what you do, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, stand at odds with the values of the kingdom of God. Without asking if you have healthy boundaries, work can become a master. Work can become a master that controls your decisions, your schedule, your family life, your spending, even your morality. Pursuing vocational health, it may look like refusing to accept the lie that you have to do something with an impressive title or or social status appeal. I truly believe that some of the most content, loving, faithful, Jesus-like people that I've ever met in my life have intentionally chosen to resist the temptation to have upward mobility or or to value the uh, the, the affirmation and perception of others. It's tempting to think that, that lining up your vocation with the will and the ways of God might look like quitting your job and becoming a full-time overseas missionary or selling everything and making some monumental change in what you do. But asking yourself how the work you do, no matter how simple, fits into the bigger picture of God's beautiful and full creation is important. Without asking if your work has a larger purpose, work can become a siphon. Something that slowly but surely drains your fuel. Something that slowly but surely drains your sense of purpose or identity in life. Something that drains your sense of joy. And so I guess the simple summation is is something like this. If Jesus is king, if Jesus is king, then all work, all of career, all of vocation is for him, it's under him, And it's with him. Work is not meant to be the main focus of our life. It's not meant to be the master of decision making. It's not meant to be our moral compass. Work isn't meant to be the thing that defines our identity. God is responsible for all of those things. And our work can be an incredible expression of that. Our work can be an incredible expression of of the way that God is king in our lives. If you're a follower of of Jesus, you're not just a welder. You you put your hands to the work of harnessing some of the most fundamental elements of God's creation for the sake of others to create infrastructure and safe facilities and beauty for the flourishing of humanity. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not just an attorney. You spend your days fighting to shrink the gap between a a broken and sinful world and the perfect justice of God that we will one day have the joy of experiencing together. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not just a barista. You help create spaces of necessary and valuable community in our city, and you use your skills to literally help us drink in the goodness of God's creation. And all the coffee drinkers say, amen, right? As both the New Testament and the Old Testament say, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That has to be our worldview. That has to be our lens or our perspective to have a truly healthy view of our vocation. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. This includes our time. We can't just be followers of Jesus from 10.30 to 11.30 on Sunday mornings in this parking lot, or maybe more accurately, 10.37 to to like 11.46. If Jesus is truly king, then there's no compartmentalization of our time. This includes our our energy. We can't put our blood, sweat, and tears into something for 50% or more of our waking hours every week that has absolutely no connection to our identity as a follower of Jesus. If Jesus is truly king, then there's no compartmentalization of our energy. And this includes our money. And I know you're thinking, why, Jordan? Why did you have to go here today? For a massive percentage of us are 
maybe even all of us, depending on how you define vocation. Our vocation is the source of all of our financial resources, which for followers of Jesus belong to God. If Jesus is truly king, then there's no compartmentalization of our money. And Jesus talks about this really often. He talks about the importance of an undivided, uncompartmentalized heart in Matthew 6 when he says this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And this is the crux of it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we know this is true. We know this is true. I don't always want it to be true. But if I, if I go back and look through the past three months of my bank statements, I start to see pretty quickly what my values are, right? Tie boat, tie boat, coffee, 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 tie boat, coffee, Netflix subscription, coffee, right? I can, I can see pretty clearly that it's self-gratification for me, right? I can see real quick that my de- desires and my satisfaction, if I'm not careful, can become an idol in my life. If I, if I view my money as primarily a means to provide all of these things for myself to eat, drink, and to be merry, then I've got it all wrong. Because newsflash, I eat Thai boat at noon and it's 3 p.m. and I'm already hungry again. Or I spent X number of dollars on coffee yesterday, but I woke up tomorrow and I needed four cups just to give me the energy I needed to get through the day. And that's kind of a silly picture but you can see how it plays out to the exponential degree, right? You can buy a new outfit with sweet shoes, but the style changes and they're going to be fill-in space in your closet next season or next year. You can buy the new car, but rust is going to come eventually and the miles are going to pile up. You can buy a new house, but something's going to be falling apart before too long or the kids are going to need more space to spread out. Now, Hear me well, there is nothing wrong with having nice clothes, with having a nice car, or having a nice house. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if those things are the investment that you are most proud of, if those things are the primary focus of all of your resources, then unfortunately you've got your confidence and your identity rooted in something that moths and vermin can destroy, that the thieves can come and steal. Now, if we take a step back, I think that we all agree that this isn't what we're chasing. We know this isn't what we're chasing. If, if we've experienced a life that's been transformed by Jesus, that's where we want our most valuable resources to be. That's where we want our treasure to be because that's where we want our hearts to be. We know this is true. And for some people, That might look like creating a a generosity fund for you or your family where you set aside some money each week. Maybe you put cash in an envelope and you use that to to meet the needs of someone that you encounter in your day-to-day life. For some people, it might look like intentionally skipping one meal a week and then committing to pray for and buy a meal for someone in need. Maybe one of our, our many friends without addresses in this city that we walk by every day. And for many people over the the past couple thousands of years, it's looked like tithing, which is this biblical concept of committing to give 10% of the money you make right back to God and then living on the other 90%. And for a lot of people listening to this, that that would be an incredible first step of, of storing up your treasures in heaven instead of storing your treasures on earth. That would be an awesome first step of obedience and generosity. But we know there's a spectrum there. Right, Some of the people listening to the sound of my voice, this kind of blows my mind, but could probably honestly live on 10% of their income and then give away 90. It's probably possible. But there are others of you that are are thinking, dude, I couldn't live on 110% of my current income, right? 10% sounds like an awesome thing, but $10 would be a lot more realistic for me. And generosity and sacrifice, they're always way more about the heart than they are about 
the materials. It's more about the heart than it is the actual resources. I love the parable of the widow's mite for, for a couple reasons, but I love the parable. It says this, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and she put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And Jesus is is drawing attention here, not to the size of the gift, but he's drawing attention to the sacrifice and to the heart of the giver. And that's really important. Now, here's the other thing that I think often gets glossed over in, in this story that Jesus tells. Do you know where Jesus is when he's telling this story? Do you know why Jesus even tells this story in the first place? When Jesus tells this, he's in the temple. He's in the place of worship. He's he's in the place that's most comparable to a church. And he's giving a stern warning against the teachers of the law, saying that if they take advantage of the generosity of others, they will be punished more severely. This It's a warning for church leaders. This is a warning for me. And that's why we love to share stories here at Slow City Church of the ways that your generosity and your giving make a huge impact in our community and on our world. That's why we work diligently to make sure that more than 10% of the money that comes into the church goes directly back out to meet the needs in our community and beyond. The past two years, it's been more like 15, 16, 17, 18% of all the money comes in, goes directly back out to meet needs of our community, to support organizations that are doing incredible work in our city and beyond. That's why it's so important to us that we share these one-for-one opportunities where we highlight and rally as a church to meet one specific need that someone in our church has identified. Two weeks ago, we presented this need to buy tires for a gentleman who he was in desperate need. And and we met that need. You met that need very quickly. Brent was able to talk to him on the phone this past week as he cried tears of joy and thankfulness, overwhelmed with the feeling of being seen and being loved, overwhelmed with the feeling of hope. That's why we're, we're excited to, to form relationships and partnerships with missionaries like Waquil, who was, who was in to visit and speak just a few months ago. And we support him as he works, does the hard, incredible, unfathomable work of caring for Afghan refugees, feeding them and loving them like Jesus. That's why we're excited to to host a meal packing event later this summer where we can put our money and our hands to the work of preparing 40,000 meals for hungry men, women, and children in Haiti. And we're called to this as a church because the church isn't a building and the church isn't a business. The church is a collection of people. The church is you and I. And so where does all of this meet you today? Maybe you're in the sweet spot doing something you love all week long. You love what you do, but you've never considered how it intersects with your faith in Jesus. And tomorrow you need to wake up, you need to brush your teeth and pull into the parking lot knowing that every meeting you sit in, every customer that you interact with, every nail that you hammer is for the glory of God and and for the good of others. Maybe you're a college student trying to figure out your career path and spending thousands of dollars a week doing that. Maybe you need to silence the voices that say that the best choice for your vocation and for your career is whatever pulls in the biggest paycheck or or whatever makes your family the most happy. A paycheck's good and a happy family's good. But maybe you need to look more closely at the ways God has equipped you and the ways God has gifted you and, and the passions that God has put on your heart in your life. Maybe you're doing something you absolutely hate. Maybe you're doing something that makes your skin crawl every day. 
something that, that hurts others or pushes others down or oppresses others. And today you need to truly consider what it would look like to step away immediately and to align the work of your hands with the ways of Jesus. Maybe you're doing something you don't love, but it gives you freedom per- to pursue so many other good and worthwhile endeavors in your life, or it gives you so much time and flexibility to spend with your family or chase some life-giving hobbies. That's incredible, and I'm happy for you. I would just say make sure that you're viewing your time with your family and that you're, you're viewing your hobbies as ways that you can love God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind and strength. And maybe you've done something for years that's made you incredibly wealthy. But you know that, that your heart and that your treasures have been pointed at things that don't last, that don't have any greater purpose outside of, of serving yourself and making yourself comfortable. And today you need to take the scary step of, of trusting God with more of your treasure and therefore trusting God with more of your heart. Because it's where our passions, our God-given gifts, it's where our, our time, energy, and, and financial resources collide that we find the true power of vocational health in our lives. When we have the awareness to understand that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and when we have the willingness to work at everything we do as though we're working for the Lord, we put ourselves under the rule and under the reign of a good king. We step into a fuller and and a better understanding of how our work reflects the very image of a creator God. And we point our hearts more fully toward him. Let me pray. God, I pray for everybody within the sound of my voice who's going to step into something tomorrow that's challenging, uh, where they maybe have to lay people off or make decisions that that are not easy. God, I pray for people who are going to walk into something that they love to do, that fills them up with life. I I pray for the people who don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. God, I pray right now that you would just give us a sense of purpose, not because um, we do some incredible things or, or, or not because, you know, we've got an impressive title, but because we can recognize that what we do impacts the world for the kingdom for your kingdom, that what we do plays a part in loving people, that what we do can connect uh, the work of our hands, the investment of our time, our energy, and our money into your goodness. And so, God, I pray that, that we would, um, God, that we would be committed to loving you first and foremost, that we, that we would not be focused on, on distractions on other idols and temptations and masters, but God, that we would wake up tomorrow with a sense of desire to love you with all our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. God, that we would view everything as yours, all our time, all our energy, all our resources, all our money as yours. And God, that we would want it to be for your glory and for the good of others. And in that way, God, may we experience that kind of vocational health filled with purpose filled with thankfulness and gratitude to you. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.